From 1977 to 2011, many altercations to the original trilogy were made. And while you may recall controversies like who shot first, Han or Greedo, and also the existence of Jedi Rocks, it takes a real brave soul to step back and view these additions objectively while ignoring the prejudice of whose childhood was better. So I'm curious if you'll agree with the picks I've chosen to be the most logical for the saga, like how the Ewoks were later allowed to actually blink. Starting with the Force Ghost of Anakin, the original version showed actor Sebastian Shaw, who played Anakin when Luke takes the mask off of Vader, revealing his father's now scarred face, and then to audiences of the 1983 theatrical movie, as well as the at-home viewers for the 1997 special editions, would see also an older Jedi version of Anakin with no scars that is also portrayed by Sebastian. In the 2004 DVD version, Hayden Christensen was digitally added, but only his head, and while the rest of Anakin's body was digitally altered to resemble Hayden, it was still the same plate as before of Sean. So only Hayden's head was used for the shot. Lucas made this change because it shows Skywalker going back to his inner persona, or otherwise before he turned to the dark side. And if you're wondering why Anakin is young but Obi-Wan isn't, as a completely non-biased article I read from The Empire stated, no not that empire. Anyway, basically the last time we saw Obi-Wan is as old Alec Guinness Obi in Episode 4, so it makes sense, but the last time we saw Anakin is pre-turn in Revenge of the Sith when he was 23, so therefore that makes sense that he would look like that. And if you're thinking the last time we saw him was a few minutes ago on the second Death Star as Sebastian Shaw, I'm pretty confident you don't want to see a floating corpse Anakin next to these other two guys, just saying. How could you even say that? Also, I've heard people say that this is better as well because we actually would recognize Hayden, whereas this is just some random old guy that no one really knows who he even is in the first place. So it makes a lot of sense uh, when you look at it that way too. And yeah, really of everything on here, I think this one's probably the most notable because it just really ties the whole saga together. And I think it is a great choice from George to put Hayden in here for this scene. Next up, we have the change of Big Starklighter, who's a character I forgot how much I I used to love until working on this video from the many aspects including that based mustache but originally a few different scenes of Biggs were shot that didn't get put in the film but later in the probably 1997 version but don't take my word for it because it might have been one of the earlier despecialized versions but one of them around the time again probably 1997 Listen to them. They're dying, restored the one scene showing Luke talking to Biggs on the Yavin 4 base and they actually had to cover up red one at one point with a digital character so that we wouldn't see him tell Luke casually that he knew his father. And while I think that that would be cool to see more of to kind of build up the mystery of Luke's father to be paid off in the prequels, I also understand how in context it's a little bit random to just tell Luke, who knows nothing of his Jedi father, that you flew with him. Also, I'd even love to see more of Biggs besides this as I think they really could have built him up more to make that sacrifice at the end more impactful. I mean Biggs really is important, he has this opening scene on Tatooine with Luke that could have been in the movie but was taken out, which makes sense for pacing and stuff, and a lot of people seem to not understand with these deleted scenes, and I always see the comments on YouTube whenever I'm researching these videos, they're like, this should have been in the movie, I mean why isn't it in the movie, but the thing is that a lot of the times it's for pacing and it's just unnecessary stuff that if it was in the movie you probably would be saying the opposite. Still, even with that said though, I still would love to see more Biggs in the movie. And yeah, I mean he's a great friend of Luke that dies here and it can it's pretty impactful if you care about the character, but until they put this one scene in there, it's kind of like, oh, this guy died. I mean, who cares? And that's one of the most important scenes in the movie, so it's kind of sad that they didn't even have that sacrifice there or one of the big deaths they're supposed to care about you wouldn't have even cared about in the original version because you don't know who Biggs is. Now it is implied that Luke cares about him, so this is arguably enough, but it's still a good scene to add in there. Another great change from A New Hope. The perfect movie kind of crosses all aesthetics to one degree or another. Another great change though is when we have that iconic moment with Han and Chewie that was for about 20 years not so iconic. So in the original, Han chases a stormtrooper down a hallway before coming to a dead end with not one stormtrooper, but you're not gonna believe this, five stormtroopers. I know, 
crazy stuff, but this would later be changed to a hangar full of stormtroopers that would make this moment much more epic and just genuinely a lot better in my opinion. And I mean, you really have to appreciate how quick and simple of a scene this is that it still establishes Han as a character to a T. And it is a little weird in the original that Han's chasing all these stormtroopers down the hallway and then he stops so once those same stormtroopers get to the end, it just doesn't make nearly as much sense. So it logically, it's also a lot better in the uh, newer version. The Wampa scene is a tricky one here, but also one that I think is greatly improved by the changes and is made even more iconic at the end of the day. In 1980, the Wampa scene was to a Jaws style approach with basically not showing the creature whatsoever other than a few hand and face shots during the initial attack. But later in 1997, yet again, where it seems most of these changes took place, the creature is given many more wide shots so that we can see the whole thing, including after Luke cuts its arm off. And while I definitely love the approach of not showing the threat at all to build suspense, I mean, I literally based an entirety of a film I made last year around that concept. I also think the newer version shows the Wampa and shows how close it is to Luke, who's dangling there, which makes the scene way more tense and scary, and definitely stuck out as one of my favorites when I was very young, even more young than now. This is impossible! Also, I believe there was a really uh, bad mistake on the operators of the creature's arm in the original that you can see, and it, it just really sticks out. It, it feels weird to me. I don't really understand how they would make that mistake. You feel like they would see that. I also understand that this was 1978, 79, when they were filming this, and they were in like Norway or somewhere crazy like that. A really cold place, of course, and they probably didn't have a bunch of screens just showing them the shots they're getting, so they probably had like one chance at this and said it is what it is. Next up, we have New Planets, and other than Naboo added in 2004, everything from this entry was also added in 1997 like many of the others and the new planets of course refers to in return of the jedi when during the celebration we now see multiple upon multiple planets celebrating the destruction of the second death star and the beginning of the end of the galactic civil war this includes coruscant bespin tatooine and naboo on top of endor like you already know this addition like the change of hayden christensen's likeness that i talked about earlier makes the saga feel like one piece and really emphasizes how this is the end of not only the original trilogy, but also the prequels as well. In this scene, there are also multiple smaller details like, just kidding, watch my short series about uh, microscopic details from each Star Wars movies if you really want to know more about the Jedi Temple seen in the background of this part, but yeah, hate to plug those shorts, but you should check them out for sure. For the argument of these planetary changes, I do think it feels a little rushed with it randomly showing every planet in the movie in like 30 seconds, but with all these things considered, it was still a great way to tie the saga together even more than before. For our first pick that's actually from an edition other than the 1997 one, we have the 2011 Blu-ray version of episode 6, which shows multiple Ewoks, including Wicket, with eyelids that actually blink, completed again with visual effects, probably just from modeling a version with the eyes closed and then just morphing or animating the eyes between between the two. This is from my own knowledge though, and this is not actually proven facts. This change, however, makes the already tedious Ewoks a good bit better since they have more life and personality, which can raise up the energy of the scenes they are featured in. And just like all the other creepy versions of the original movies, Jedi had to have this one to keep us up at night. Though it still is a great change that just genuinely improves the quality of the movie and these are the best ones when George just goes back and fixes things that actually were not that good. Next up from the 2004 changes, one was the eyebrows of Sebastian Shaw who in the original film is seen with his actual bushy dark brow but this is removed here to keep continuity with Revenge of the Sith where he is burned including all of Anakin's hair. And since this was released in 2004 it's almost like George was trying to tease the Mustafar scene in this movie to the fans that actually cared and weren't losers, but also here Anakin was given blue eyes to keep with Hayden's own blue eyes from the prequels. In 2019, 
looks like they might have met somewhere in the middle with some very faint brows, but I guess it just depends on how accurate the science would be, and I would assume that goes to 2004, as Vader has no hair on his head anyway. To finish off the video, I thought I'd go over every change made to the prequels, since everyone always talks about the original trilogy changes, but there still are a few brief ones from the prequels I found pretty cool. First off, most notably in uh, episode one, Yoda was changed from Jesse Pinkman puppet. I don't trust him to a clean digital Yoda from the other films. My only problem with this is that episode one now has the best looking Yoda, which makes going to Attack of the Clones a bit jarring, but it's still a great change nonetheless. Also, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan's force speed was redone to have it look more accurate, and also Senators yelling vote now was replaced with general roars of disagreement. In episode two, we get a voiceover from Shmi added in later releases during her visions of death. Also, in her vision the Sith, more clone voices were added to the Utapau battle, and also a transition on Mustafar was changed twice, along with Moss being added to a Kashyyyk building to make it look better. So like I said, there's not too many changes in the prequels, it's really just minor stuff, and then also Yoda, which is a big one. I was considering doing just a whole video about the prequel changes, since that'd be very unique, and everyone always talks about the original ones uh, instead of the prequel ones, but I, I don't know, I, I just didn't think this would be enough for its own video. What's a change from the special editions that you actually think was great that I didn't talk about here? Let me know in the comments, but anyway, that's it for this video. You can subscribe if you want to. I upload every Friday uh, at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also, I post shorts on Saturday, but uh, yeah, see ya.